Aloha. I am so happy to have my good friend Alda here with me today. Uh, she's a, a wonderful woman. She's written three books. She's a poet and uh, she's uh, just an all around special person. So we have lots of things to talk about today and I hope you'll enjoy. Hi, Alda. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi. Thanks for having me, Emily. I'm really happy to be here. Um, let's see where to start. Basically, I got my fine arts degree from Syracuse University. So I, I started my career as an artisan, as a craftsman and um, jewelry making goldsmith. And I've done that for professionally probably 25 years. And then um, I decided to change careers, actually. Um, I was able to go back and get my master's degree in education and counseling and human services. And I did that basically, my husband and I had adopted a three-year-old daughter from Mexico. And um, by that time she was 12, 13, giving us some problems. So I went back to school thinking, well, I can do this. You know, I can learn about um, what's happening with her, what's going on, you know? And so I did that. I got my master's degree from the University of Idaho and um, pretty soon decided to change careers entirely. And uh, my husband said, well, we can go anywhere. Where do you want to go? Because we were in our own business, you know? So I said, well, I don't know. I know uh, we had been to Hawaii before and uh, he said he loves to serve. Plus he had studied Father Damien in high school. He went to a Catholic high school and he learned about Molokai and all that. And so uh, we, we chose Molokai <laughs> and we went there in 1991. I worked um, in a school um, as an elementary school counselor and uh, Jim also uh, got a master's degree in family mediation during that time. And our daughter already was 18, so she didn't come to Hawaii by then. And um, we kind of felt like we're going to school every day and we don't have kids and the kids would come, the neighborhood kids would come over to our house after school anyway, because we had a basketball rim on the, in, up above the garage and things like that. And we, we do things with the kids and we finally said, you know, we need to have kids. <laughs> so we went into foster care basically and um, became an emergency shelter for teenagers on Molokai. And um, later on, uh, when our kids, we, we adopted two boys um, through that process of foster care um, and learning about that. And by the time they were in high school, um, my oldest wanted to come to Maui for high school, which was a good idea. So um, we decided to apply for a job uh, here on Maui and ended up, um, co-sharing a job for Maui County through the state, recruiting licensing um, and training foster parents. And we did that and loved it. It was absolutely great. But what we found is the kids and the families really had little or no support. And that really grieved us because so many were having issues like we had had and they didn't have any place to turn. They really didn't know how to deal with it. And a lot of this is connected with grief. So that's how we're gonna segue into the whole topic because um, we find that these kids are left hanging. They really don't have that kind of support to deal with the psychological effects of loss, abandonment. You know, they feel abandoned, they feel betrayed, they feel the loss, they feel the grief of losing their family ties. And uh, some have open adoptions, some can see their families, but since a lot, a lot of them are dysfunctional anyway, it doesn't usually work out. So there are a lot of, a lot of problems associated with uh, foster care and adoption. So anyway, we moved to Maui and uh, did that. And in 2005, uh, my husband and I started a nonprofit called Keiki Kukua in the next seven years. That means, oh, that means help the children. Keiki is children, Kukua means help or aid. Um, so it was the goal, the mission was really to um, help foster families cope with these kids that were rebelling and they didn't have the services they need. And unfortunately, that's still the case. 
Um, not much has changed because these, um, we'll talk about what happens to these kids and um, how they manifest their grief in, in all the wrong ways. And uh, there's really not a lot of support on that. So anyway, we would provide uh, like Christmas parties at the Grand Wailea. We would do different activities um, for the kids and the families so that they could bond, they could get to know each other and uh, be able to work through the problems. Uh, we partnered with DHS or Child Protective Services and other organizations. Um, and it, it was really good. We had a thrift store and we um, hired foster kids. Most of them had aged out of the system, which if you don't know about that, basically means when you're 18, um, unless you're going to college, you um, leave and often you go back to your biological family. So we did that until 2012 when we retired at that point. And uh, my husband died about two years ago now and uh, the whole grief thing came up again. Luckily, I know you, so I read your book and really helped and um, decided to write my own book, which um, some of it has to do with grief. And then I wrote another book, which um, <clears throat> has to do with coping skills, not just for our own grief when we lose a loved one, but I had in mind also the children that don't really get over their grief a lot of times. That's, that's so true. I think um, much of the time, children get kind of left out in the, in the grief process. When, when they are dealing with some kind of grief, people kind of discount it or don't think it's gonna affect them. And I don't know why <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make any sense, but that just, I know as, as a child, I was, um, when somebody would die, nobody would talk to me about it. You know, they, they'd make sure that I was out of the room when they talked about it. And it was like, what am I supposed to do with all these thoughts? and questions that I have and, and nobody wanted to talk. So that, that makes it just, it doubles up on the grief. And I was just talking to a very successful adult man um, the other day. And one of his biggest struggles in life was that he was adopted. And he just felt, even though the, his adoptive parents were wonderful, he had a, a wonderful life, wonderful education. A uh, wonderful career. He still always felt that he'd been abandoned, that there there had to have been something wrong with him, or why wouldn't they love me? Did so, he ever uh, reconnect with his biological family? Ultimately, he did. It was a real challenge because in in his situation, the in the state that he lived in, the uh, they had rules about the records were sealed, and nobody was supposed to have. Uh, any access to them, but he eventually had a, a biological sister reach out through the adoption process so that she was able to contact him and it, it changed his world. So yeah. it's, it's so, so wonderful when you can have that kind of connections, but lots of people never do if they're adopted or if they're in foster care, they just don't have a, a healthy connection. That, that can serve them. I have a friend in Denver who um, was raised in a foster, Christian foster home. And uh, not until she was 18 did she find out her heritage is actually Jewish and she had a biological sister. So, you know, the system is really not working for a lot of people in, in different states. It's not just one. Mm -hmm. Uh, even in New Zealand, um, you know, we connected a little with the system there, and it's sometimes even more brutal than here, um, because they deal again with minority Maori population, and uh, it's sort of, you know, analogous to our Native Americans here, but it's, it's much worse in the foster care system. So there's that kind of prejudice that's unconscious that kind of seeps into it and just exasperates the whole thing. Uh, and we're, we're having essentially a humanitarian crisis right now with what's going on in Ukraine and all the families that are coming across. And 
so many people or children are going to be without somebody and with the system so strained with with how it is it's it's a potential real tragedy so it's yeah, something see, i think we, we all need to pay attention to yeah in that case there's not only the uprooting and maybe separation from the family but the whole culture mm -hmm. the whole uprooting of your home you know is gone i can't even imagine the impact that that will have hearing the bombs go off having to flee, um, maybe losing, you know, some of your family members. It's just horrific. It really is. And of course, my philosophy, and I talk about it a lot, is that to base everything on love and to, to focus on that and how can we love and care for other people and be able to provide them comfort and support. And I think in the, the case of, of foster children, especially, um, I've always had a, a soft spot for them. We had not in my, uh, not with my mom and dad, we didn't have foster children, but my sister had foster children. Uh, my aunt had foster children. I had two aunts adopt foster children. So I've, I've known them through my whole growing up. And really gained an appreciation for the kinds of things that that they go through that nobody else has to go through and we're expecting so much of them uh, and people just don't have an understanding of of that sort of a thing one thing that really bothered me was kids are, are moved frequently without a whole lot of warning and they tell them to just put all their stuff in the garbage bag and take it with them and I was trying to start a campaign to collect suitcases so that a foster child would have their own suitcase, their own one thing where they could keep their stuff. And the system in the county where I lived at the time wouldn't allow it because they didn't allow the foster children to have a possession like that to take things from police to place. And I just That's thought that was true. crazy. Here it's, it's enlightened enough that we did that every year. We did that luggage drive and it was very successful we had backpacks we had suitcases we had everything and you know again um that gives the child a little bit more some you know feeling of of something is mine i can you know this is this is my possession this is where i live wherever i go you know but it's still um they lose what they lose is the sense of belonging real real i think that's really the key of the problem there's no sense of belonging and i'll, I'll talk more about how to cope with that but i also want to say that um we don't realize how much pathology and dysfunction comes from that lack of a sense of belonging like you said ukraine mm -hmm. is experiencing with that they're leaving their homeland, you know, but these kids leave their homeland in the sense, you know, going back to here in the sense of leaving their, the only home they've ever known. And so it's kind of similar, but what we have here in this country is a whole bunch of uh, disorders mm -hmm. that come off of that. And you end up, uh, I didn't write one of them down here. I'll write it down. I just thought of it. But um, here they are, here's what I got. Phobias, rage, hoarding, depression, anxiety, defiance, resentment, sense of betrayal, lack of trust, lying, stealing, hatred, and homelessness. Wow, what a list. Yeah. And, and that's what I did on the top of my head, just yeah. you know, thinking about the kids I've known and the family struggling, like, you know, you said this man, even though he had a good adopted home, oftentimes that is not enough. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of what is enough, the, the podcast is Grief and Happiness. What is it that we can do for foster children in particular to bring happiness into their lives, something genuine that, that we can do? Well, I wrote a few things down, okay? So let's see. 
as I mentioned earlier, it's a coping mechanism, right? You're not gonna, it's, it's kind of like a crisis management strategy because you're not necessarily going to um, alleviate the pain, but you are going to establish a sense of longing that you can do to the extent that you try. I mean, if you don't try to do that, obviously it's not gonna happen. So the first thing I would say is just talk, you know, to the child. I've got to say too, that some kids do not seem to experience the loss at all. They don't act out. They don't um, appear to be damaged or disturbed. Those kids are often introverts. They just kind of implode. One thing I also forgot to list is cutting. They cut. You know about that, right? So oh, yeah. Cutting. So that, I didn't even put that down. Um, those kind of behaviors are usually those who don't act out, but, but, but are trying to alleviate their pain in some distorted way that, you know, is really difficult. And then suicide is another one. So anyway, okay, and I'll stop there with that. Yes. Let's go into the happiness, happy. yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it does sound pretty depressing. It, mm -hmm. it, it's a terrible crime what we do to these kids. So anyway, the first is really talk to them, I would say. See where they're at. You know, see how they're feeling. Um, explain that, you know, the rules in this home may be different than the one you lived in before. And let's talk about the rules. We used to have family meeting every week. And we had the thing on the refrigerator door and they would, we had an agenda and the kids could write down what they want to talk about. Like, I don't want to do dishes or, you know, whatever it is. And so uh, we would have a family meeting where we even got to speak. Everyone, we had, you know, refreshments. It was a fun thing. And that really helped because the kids will then become, and this is every family, it shouldn't just be foster or adopted kids, it should be done in every family where they can talk to the, the kids can talk to parents about anything, parents can talk to the kids about what they need, and it's confidential, you have to teach the kids not to go put it out in the neighborhood. But kids are, if they own it, you know, if they feel like they own part of this, um, the rules and regulations of this home, whatever they are, and hopefully they're not too strict. You know, um, another thing we used to do is a trust bank. So when they did something good, they it's like money in the bank, right? And if they get so much money, you know, or they did something, they made the effort, like they did their homework or whatever it was that we established it, whatever area there was trouble in, you do a trust bank. And then if they screw up, you say, okay, we have to, that's a referral. You have to take a certain amount out, okay? But if the trust bank gets full, then we rejoice, right? We have, we're happy. We get, we get, everyone gets a treat or we get to, they get to choose what they want to do, you know? So there's a lot of ways to do that. And then we had responding, listening and responding contests. <laughs> And it's all about, you know, the same thing, just being able to really listen and, you know, to tell the other person, you know, you're not listening to me um, or, and responding because sometimes you'd say something to the child and they'd ignore you, right? And you feel ignored, like, it, you know, did you hear me kind of thing. So all of those um, are good techniques. But with foster kids and adopted kids to some extent, there are no magic bullets. You know, it's, it's just whatever tools you have in your toolbox, you know, that you can apply at a certain situation. So I think just the, the overall thing is talk to them, family meetings, you know, uh, trust bank. Um, Make sure you do fun activities together, which sounds obvious, but um, often doesn't happen because you're angry they didn't listen and stuff like that. So, oh, consistency is another one. If you're going to do something like a family meeting, you really have to do it 
Because a lot of times, you know, the kids will say, I can't do it then, you know, especially if they're in high school, we can do it in high school. You know, um, I'm going to go to the baseball game or something. So um, it's easy to just shove it under the rug and say, okay, we won't do it this week. And sometimes you can't. But the consistency that you provide is really important. I would say very important. And going along with that is another one, which is establish, um, I should say, validate their culture, okay? If they're from, you know, a different culture than you, um, find out what that is if the child doesn't know it. Um, and, and celebrate that culture, like with our daughter, you know, we would do um, Mexican food, you know, do parties with pinatas, um, try to learn a little Spanish, <laughs> Mexican, whatever, and <clears throat> encourage her to um, pursue that part of her life, you know, because she's 100% she's Mexican, so, and Indian too, I think some native people there, she's got some of that culture. And we always encourage that. Again, some kids aren't the least bit interested, you know, in cooking, say, Mexican food. Um, but I would definitely present it as a thing to do for fun. You know, don't make it a chore or a duty, but just something um, that they can celebrate their culture. And you, again, use your word, just say, we're celebrating your culture. We're celebrating the fact that you are Mexican, you know, um, or Cinco de Mayo or any of these um, festivals or um, traditions that go along with that culture, whatever the culture is, you know, research that and then celebrate that day. We did that a lot. I think that's so important. I know when, when I had uh, my School of Arts, I wrote a grant to make it so that if the foster children wanted to come, that they didn't have to pay. And the, it was hard getting the word out among the foster parents. It was like the, the county didn't want to, they, they thought they were like advertising. And I said, no, you're providing a service for these kids. Nobody's know, paying for so it. Obvious, and they are just so difficult to deal with. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the kids that came, I, I happened to have one class that uh, they were all like early teens, boys, like between 12 and 14. And they all happened to be boys. It just happened yeah. that way and when they first got there they kind of weren't sure why they were there or what theater was or what acting or plays or anything like that they didn't know anything about it and I, I think what happened was their parents saw oh here's a way that I can have a free babysitter for oh, yeah. <laughs> a couple hours a week <laughs> and 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 that was okay if that's what got them there that was fine yeah. but boy once those those boys got into it they just they loved it they just found a place where they could thrive and they met other people who had who were also foster children who also had challenges and by working together and doing something positive with the theater things they they just blossomed it was it was amazing to see that what we could do with with having them and I, I just loved it. They even put an article about it in the newspaper with their picture, and boy, were they thrilled. <laughs> we had to get permission, of course, from everybody to allow them to, to be in that picture. We weren't allowed to take any pictures of the kids. Yeah, this, this was a, a special thing that they, wow, they actually that's... worked it out. The, the newspaper worked it out with the county that they uh -huh. could do this because yeah. they wanted to show an example of something that really works, that, that helps the kids thrive. Well, I think any creative activity where they can express themselves, uh, what we did, we had <clears throat> here in Maui, we did a picnic party festival things with kids. And we did a magic show, as you know, it's where I met Elaine and Neil. And we did uh, other activities too. And one of them 
a, a volunteer had a white horse mm -hmm. who loved to be painted, believe it oh, or wow. not. And so we wow. took our kids, they put their hand in different buckets of paint and they put their handprint on the horse. Wow. <laughs> Hey, the horse was a piece of art. <laughs> wow. And the horse was so gentle and so sweet and seemed to really understand what was going on. And um, the kids just loved it. I love that. That's so, so beautiful. And one of the other concerns that I've had about foster children is the aging out that you mentioned. <clears throat> Where I lived in Ventura, they created this fabulous place that was called the wave uh, working artists in Ventura and it was a whole complex that had lots of like apartments that were a combination of apartments and studios that artists could live in and they had like a big roll-up garage door on the, the front of the apartment so that they could have like once a week they'd be able to put all their wares out and people could see their studio and they could sell their their wares and it, it was really beautiful. And they also had some very high end um, like apartments that people could buy that like condos that were in part of the con uh, complex also that had, had ocean views and really lovely. But the third part was they had a special program for foster kids who were aging out mm -hmm. and they provided a place for them to live. They provided life skills training for them they provided uh, work training for them. They, they just, they fostered them, these, these kids that have aged out. And, and that's, that's such an incredibly important time because if you've been supported until you're 18 and all of a sudden they say, okay, take care of yourself. Who oh, can do yeah. that, you know? <laughs> know. So if, if there were more things like that, where they, because the, the people in, in that big, beautiful complex could all interact with each other so that the um, the I hate to call them kids but the the foster children who had aged out could interact with these artists and find ways to creatively express themselves and the people that lived in the high-end um, condos were supporting them and, and buying the stuff and getting to know the kids and becoming friends and it, it was just a beautiful community that they created there I'd, I'd love to see more things like that Yes, I don't know why we're still so backward in our treatment of these children. It's, it seems a shame. Um, one of the things you mentioned, life skills, um, I want to add to that social skills. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of times developmentally they're behind and, uh, and, and their families have not modeled social skills to them. So they, they really don't know how to behave. And the uh, adjunct to that is also they don't know how to behave in a normal family because what's normal is not their normal. What we would consider a normal family, they have to be told and educated and shown, no, what you were living in, first of all, is not your fault. You know, you had no control over it. Um, this is how... You may you don't have to be that explicit, but you show by your example how normal folks live. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it's social skills. And it's being for them to be able to accept what we call normal. In other words, no beating, no abuse, um, that kind of thing, no neglect. Um, you can have as much as you want to eat. Um, no one's going to beat you up because you came home five minutes late. Um, those kind of things are very hard to teach because the children, they hear what's supposed to be normal, but somehow psychologically they gravitate towards um, disrupting. Mm -hmm. When they see what's normal, they want to undo it. And, and they're not familiar with it. Yeah, but they're also trying to uh, go back to what they feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have like 40% of former foster kids are homeless. It's a huge amount. 
wow. because they don't know, even though you've had them for a while and you've modeled all these good behaviors, they still don't have, a lot of them still don't have a sense of home. And so that's our big challenge is to be able to give that, but yet toe the line so you're not a doormat because mm -hmm. some have learned to be very manipulative and controlling of, of that, of them, because they're the only thing they can control in their life, right? Everything else has happened to them and they feel out of control. So the way they compensate is by, I'm in control now, I'm not gonna let you tell me what to do. So yeah. it's, it's a real challenge. I think it'd be wonderful if we could create some sort of a safety net for say 18 to 21 year old former foster children that they could get the help and guidance that they need during that time period. And, and we're not serving them now. We're not doing anything to serve them. And it would be- No, and I wonder how DHS would react to that if they would even want us to do that. I mean, that's a, it's a thought, you know, because it's something that they really need. They really do. That that would be uh, my listeners out there. If you're looking for a nonprofit to start, <laughs> this would be one way that that uh, you could really serve the society, our society, in in a positive way. I'd like to talk to you too, all the about your your poetry and in, in the book that you wrote, your poetry book. Okay. Um. Actually, that's a good place to go with what I'm just going to say. So, <clears throat> here's the book. It's a beautiful book, Em, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And I did the illustrations inside. Let's see. I'm not going to turn to every page, but this says a pure heart. And that's chapter two, I think. So it's actually a theme two. So I have uh, 14 different themes in the book, but um, <clears throat> it's about the heart. The, this whole conversation when we talked about grief, um, especially in foster kids. It's about, you know, after all the intellectual decisions we make, in the end, it's about they need to know they're loved. That is, that is key. Um, <clears throat> They can understand things intellectually and um, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But when the heart speaks, you can't argue that, right? You have to have, it, it's like, it's not unconditional love because you have to abide by the rules that are imposed on you and the rules that will make them safe. Not, not uh, restrictive rules, but rules that are necessary to keep them healthy and happy. And, um, you know, also participating in, in uh, the family uh, dynamic, whether it be chores or vacations or whatever. And sometimes they won't even let foster kids go on vacation with the foster family, which is another really sad thing. So they get put into a temporary foster home for two weeks, and then they go back. And um, that does not help the situation. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So um, anyway, to be loved. And the second thing I would say is to find purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wrote the book because I had been writing poetry for a long time anyway. And when Jim died, we were married 47 years. So it's really difficult. Still is, you know, two years later. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote, I felt like it was my creative expression, my ability to um, turn grief into some purpose, some, some usefulness, and also to express my love not just my love of, you know, my family and my husband, but also um, <clears throat> expressing the pain that the kids had caused us because it was not smooth sailing by any means. And again, the resources are so limited. 
I am glad I got my master's degree because it gave me some idea of how to help, you know, um, how to work with these kids. And we did parenting classes and did all that because you really need the whole package, like you were saying, you know, and it doesn't end when they're 18. It has to be a transition from what they've already learned and hopefully integrated into their lives. And that, that takes mentorship. And a lot of foster parents work, they have other kids in the house. They don't always have the time to mentor as these kids really need it. But anyway, um, back to the book, there are certain chapters that talk about uh, family and children. There's another one on suffering, um, selfishness, separation and loss, which of course is what we're talking about here. So there are poems about those things, as well as um, my Christian perspective, which is as an optimist, I believe that things can be healed through prayer. Um, so um, there's a lot of power that comes through that spiritual aspect, however you understand it. Um, I think that we need all of that. And, and so the book, this book, um, just has a lot of that in it, all the facets of, of um, healing. Could I ask you to read one of the poems that maybe has to do with love or happiness or joy or? Okay, <laughs> let's see. Well, I have my last, <clears throat> my last chapter, my last theme is called Just for Fun. And you see the jester there? Oh, cute. Yeah, and also my third book is a coloring book, and he features in my coloring book too. But, um, okay, this is a poem I wrote to my husband <clears throat> when he was, when we were first dating. <laughs> okay, here it goes. It's called, Be My Surfboard, Baby. <laughs> yeah, he's a surfer. Be my surfboard baby, a bright yellow mover, so smooth and so fast. We'll sail past the others. They'll wonder who we are and marvel at our form. I'll come for the ride, baby, the direction's your own, as we weave through the waves. But I'll guide you sometimes if you should grow weary or lose your way. There'll be rough waters, baby. I must hold on real tight. Breakers can't pry us apart. The biggest of waves will handle with ease. This skill is taught by love. Be my surfboard, baby. I'll wear my bikini. We're so finely matched. Adventure awaits us. What fun and what daring gliding over the waves. Oh, I love that. That <laughs> is so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this, this has been a very interesting visit and I, I really appreciate your perspective on kind of lost members of our society. I think we could call these, these foster children. And the, the good news is there is hope out there. We, we can all do something that can help along the way. I know my sister had uh, one of her foster daughters, she had had quite a few, but one of them had been burned severely when her brother set her crib on fire. Oh, and she had been through one home after another because she had so many surgeries and things that happened to, to her and the parents just couldn't handle them. So they'd send them on to the next person and they got her when she was maybe 12. And yeah. When she got to be 18, she stayed, was able to stay that whole time. They said, you don't have to go anywhere. Great. And, and they, they didn't officially adopt her, but she called them mom and dad. And they, they always considered her their daughter. And she stayed with them until she got married. And they, their re relationship, they continued. They, I, I consider her a niece. And 
she's though that she's like my age <laughs> but uh, she had children and grandchildren and then my sister had great grandchildren because of those children and she can they she was always considered family and what what would be wonderful in this world is for the people that have the heart to do it to uh see what they could do either it doesn't have to be having them actually foster in your home, but you can do things for the foster children in your community. So just find ways that, that you can make the world a happier, brighter place. I, I find that when you're dealing with grief, one of the things that can bring you happiness is when you serve others and find a way to really make a difference in their lives. That, that'll make you happy too. So it's it's very good thing to do, and I appreciate you all the being here so much today because you're giving a whole different perspective than people usually think about. We tend not to think about people that we don't really relate to, and it's important that we do. Right. Well, they're hidden from the the society, and um, partly for their own protection, but. Because of it, we, you know, there's not much out there for them. That's right. We, we can make a difference in that. We can. So. We absolutely can. So thank you so much for being here today. And we'll have um, links for all those books and, and whatever else you'd like to have in our show notes so that you can keep track of her and uh, get your own copies of her books. They're quite wonderful. I have all three. And... I encourage you to find ways to find happiness through what you can do for somebody else. So uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. Thank you.